In 1988, when I'd, uh, I'd studied computer science, electronics engineering, applied physics, I'd done some research on information theory, and I'd spent three years working on designing electronics, electronic systems to prevent lighting systems, industrial lighting systems from blowing up. Uh, in the trade, this is known as a, uh, a non-passive failure. And at the time, I was in the UK working in research, working on these uh, electronic systems. And I can remember at the time hearing about the very first quantum bits, qubits, in 1988. Now, <clears throat> among the engineering and scientific community, this was a, a little bit of a sensation. But everywhere else, it didn't really, uh, didn't really raise any eyebrows. People didn't really notice it. But back then, I thought, oh, this, is, this could be interesting. Something interesting could come out of this. A year later, I moved to Germany. Having fixed the problem with the exploding light bulbs, and I became a midwife to the World Wide Web. And back then, this clunky, buggy document hypertext system, the very first of its kind, a scalable hypertext system, we were working on this. And I remember thinking, and my colleagues as well, this is probably going to change a lot. This is probably going to be a fundamentally new kind of technology. We didn't realize there would be things like cat videos and fake news and cyber wars and World of Warcraft. But we did think it, something momentous would, have, would happen. I think if, at the time, if you'd asked anybody generally about the impact of the web, people will just have said, it's a neat way to write documents, that's all. But what the World Wide Web did for us was give us a new way to present information and a new way to interact with each other. This interaction and information presentation was a fundamental paradigm shift, something fundamentally new. It allowed a new level of interaction between people. And at the time, the implications of that, as I said, were not clear. It's perhaps a coincidence that at the same time, of course, we had this beginnings of quantum computing, the first qubits. But if we want to understand a little bit about quantum computing, we need a metaphor. We need some kind of stabilizer wheels. So kids, when they learn to ride a bicycle, they have stabilizer wheels. We need stabilizer wheels. And uh, our stabilizer wheels today are going to be coins and balls. So, if you throw a coin a thousand times, then give or take a standard deviation, you'll get 500 heads and 500 tails. Incidentally, the standard deviation, the actual number of coins you see when you toss a thousand coins, uh, bears a very, very deep mathematical relationship to the distribution of prime numbers. It's not relevant here, but it's an interesting fact. If you have two coins, then, and you throw them both, then some of the time you'll get an heads plus heads, head plus tail, tail plus heads, tails plus tails. And each of those variants will also, they will occur 250 times, plus or minus a standard deviation. And with three coins, eight different variations, each one occurring 125 times. For quantum computing, we need a different model. This is where the ball comes in. 
Now, if we take this ball here and we define a, some arbitrary point on its surface, say here, if we spin the ball and then stop it, then that point on the surface is just as likely to point in one direction as in any other direction. And we can describe that with two angles, an angle we call the azimuth, which is this way, and an angle we call the elevation, this way. Strictly speaking, we also need to know the size of the ball, but physicists are very clever about cheating. So normally in physics, we define the radius of the ball to be one. That makes the mathematics very easy and uh, some of the calculations very simple. This is our simple model of a qubit, a quantum bit. Like a ball, a qubit has a specific state, a specific direction when we look at it. The interesting thing happens when we put the ball or the qubit behind a screen or inside a bag. Just imagine that you can't look inside this bag. It's transparent for a reason. <laughs> so you can see what's happening. So just imagine that we've got a spinning ball in here. Something's happening to it. With a quantum bit, with a qubit, that ball can be in many possible states, have many possible positions at the same time. And we call this superposition. Also, we can link two balls together so that the position, the direction of one of them completely determines the position and direction of the other one, and vice versa. You can even put three of them in there, or as many as you want. We call that entanglement. And entanglement and superposition are the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. And the question then becomes, how can we use that? We need to convert these qubits into bits. The simplest example is if you imagine a qubit and you imagine that it's, you've done something to it and it's now pointing at the equator. If we repeat that experiment like the coin a thousand times, then 500 times we will measure it as pointing upwards and 500 times downwards. So it's just like a coin. The interesting part happens, of course, when we've prepared the qubit in the right way, when we've entangled the qubits in the right way, then that's no longer the case. Then each qubit will favor a one or a zero more than just with the coin. We found a way to get inside or behind the pure probability of the coin by using quantum mechanics. The trick with quantum computing is to construct these interactions between the balls, between the qubits, in such a way that the right answers, the answer you're looking for, occurs more often, and the answers you're not looking for occur less often. We call this constructive and destructive interference. And this is the principle behind every quantum program. In order to understand how that actually works, we need to look a little bit at the history, how quantum computers actually came into being. In 1973, a man called Charles Bennett, this is an extract from his scientific paper. Um, don't worry, you're not supposed to understand it. He showed that any computer program can be reconstructed so it's reversible. And that's important because that means that you can execute the computer program, get it to produce a result, and then run it backwards so that you're in the initial state you were when you started. This is important because it allows us to now construct programs with quantum mechanical systems. In other words, we can run a quantum program to produce a result without actually changing anything. This is a major step. A few years later, in 1988, when I was, when I was fighting my exploding light bulbs, the very first qubits were invented. And a few years later, a physicist called Richard Feynman came up with a proof 
that you could actually use these kinds of programs to solve problems, a particular problem, which was infeasible to solve on a classical computer. It was so complex and so difficult that a classical computer would never be able to solve it, but a quantum computer was trivial. That changed again in 1994, when Peter Shore developed an algorithm for factoring numbers. Factoring numbers is a difficult problem. We know that 5 times 3 is 15. 5 and 3 are the factors of 15. If we want to factor a 1,000-bit number, and even with the biggest supercomputer we have today, this would take millions or billions of years. Peter Shaw's algorithm sped that up. And if we had a perfect quantum computer, it would mean we could factor such numbers in weeks or days or maybe even hours or minutes. That was the, really the birth and the impetus that quantum computing needed. Quantum computers are very beautiful. This is the inside of one. Uh, I, I like to think that the reason they are beautiful is because form follows function. And quantum computing, the function of quantum computing is as fundamental as it gets. We're now at the stage where we have quantum computers, we're able to use them, we're able to program them, we're searching for better, industrializable, more robust, more stable technologies. We're learning how to write algorithms for them. We're working on different types of quantum computing, different types of qubit, different types of chips for doing this. So we're now out of the stage of what we call quantum, the quantum physical era. We're now in the stage of the era of quantum readiness. And I see this when uh, I look at the number of students attending university courses on quantum computing, or the number of attendees on online summer schools and classes. The numbers are astounding. Um, we are now at the stage where we're getting ready to move into the phase of quantum advantage. And quantum advantage means the point where quantum computers overtake classical computers, become so performant that they are solving problems way beyond what we will ever be able to do on current computers. We have quantum computers. The technology is starting to mature. And the question is, are we ready for quantum computers? I think we are. I'd like to encourage you to, everybody out there, everybody here, you have access to completely free quantum computers. You can try it out. It's very simple. Give it a go. I think we're ready for quantum computers. I'd like to invite you to join me on the journey to try this out and learn this technology. Anybody want some qubits? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>